Hello and welcome to the Pro Tipster Tennis Podcast. I'm joined today by Pro Tipster Johnny, our tennis expert here at Pro Tipster. So we're going to have a chat with the Australian Open Grand Slam Tournament, how it's been going so far. We'll have some tips for you as well. And we'll have a few words from a journalist friend over there covering the tournament in Australia. Hello, Johnny. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, uh, yeah, look, I know this is a, a little bit different than our normal uh, football podcast, obviously, because this is a tennis podcast, but it's something that we wanted to put out as well. Tennis is a massive uh, sport, lots of betting opportunities, so we wanted to start putting out a tennis one. Maybe in the future we'll dedicate a separate uh podcast feed for this but at the moment we'll have them both coming out on the same one look uh, there's stuff going on behind the scenes at pro tipster with new websites and stuff like that so maybe in the future but for now we'll be releasing the football and tennis podcast here on the same channel so if you don't like tennis and or the sound of my voice <laughs> you can uh, stop this and, and wait until tomorrow where we'll have football but if you're a tennis fan and a betting fan you know we have our expert pro tipster johnny here to help us go through the tennis. First off, Johnny, I want to ask you a, a, a general kind of betting uh, about tennis question. And uh, when you're looking at the players, what do you look for form-wise? Because, you know, is there much of a difference between someone playing on clay and on grass? Um, how, how, how do you look at that? Um, obviously, Australian Open is a specific tournament. Uh, it's the first Grand Slam of the year. Uh, it comes after some preparation period. There are players who play more uh, preparation tournaments than others. We have a lot of big class players in this tournament, for example. For, for, for them, it's directly first big match at the Australian Open b- before they didn't play anything because either they were injured and wanted to get as much recovery as possible. So form-wise um, and betting-wise, of course, I'm looking at the current form. But it's not always the most important factor. Obviously, if we are looking at a specific head-to-head match, uh, and if the players play a decent amount of matches between each other, we shall have a look at how did they compete at different surfaces. Because we know, of course, like you said, there are some players who play better on clay, uh, who are better on the hard courts, or there are some grass specialists. So this has to be taken into account. But it's only one of the factors that uh, you should look at when you consider a bet for, for for a tennis game. Okay, good. So look, as we're recording, there's loads of matches going on here. I have flash score open here. There's loads of tennis balls flying around the place. Um, so how's it been going so far, the Aussie Open? Now, we missed the start. Obviously, we couldn't get a podcast out last week. But, uh, you know, Venus Williams is out. Uh, Nadal is, is playing well. What happened with Venus? Yeah, well, Venus had a very, very tough, very tough draw. She was playing Belinda Bencic of uh, Switzerland. Belinda Bencic won uh, the Hopman Cup uh, with Roger uh, earlier this year, the unofficial championship for the mixed mixed uh, pairs. Um, also, in, also in Australia. Uh, so it was a for for her. It was a really, really tough draw. She's not at, at her best form. Uh, like she was at the, at the at the end of the last season, and she couldn't just find the weapons to to beat Belinda. Uh, whether it's a surprise or not, I would say it's not a it's not a huge surprise. Obviously, it was uh, the first first day was uh, was just horrible for uh, USA. I think they went uh, three wins out of fifteen matches <laughs> uh, on the first day, which is something that history doesn't remember. So it was not just Venus Williams, it was also others. We've got Jack Sock out also from, from USA, uh, seated player. Uh, we've got, basically we've got on the first day, three of the last year's uh, semi-finalists at the US Open, uh, and now I'm talking about the VTA, so women's tennis were out. So it was Venus Williams, Coco van der Weeg, and uh, Slope Stephens. So, that brings us to another topic, which we, we will discuss later, the unpredictability of women's tennis. But, um, yeah, the first two days were, were exciting. Nadal was back after his injury. He cruised past Victoria uh, Estrella Burgos, uh, a bit unknown player, 6-1, 6-1, 6-1. And he looked really decent. If, for Nadal, you know, 
he's got the qualities to to compete for the title at, at, at every Grand Slam. The, the question always is uh, if he can stay healthy. If he can stay healthy, he's got the weapons. He's got the spin on his uh, forehand. He moves well. Um, he's a lefty, so that gives him certain uh, certain advantage. Yeah, Nadal, uh, Nadal as well. He's, he's such a fan favorite. I think I think a lot of people would like would love to see him have. You know, have 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 you know, eleven months injury free and and win just loads and then retire gracefully. But kind of as it is, is that because he keeps getting these injuries, he he kind of keeps have to having to come back and prove himself again and again and again. But isn't it? It's just, I I just find it brilliant that he keeps coming back and he hasn't thrown in the towel yet. I think mentally he's one of the strongest players on the on, on the circuit. Uh, He's got to fight with the injuries. Uh, obviously, the injuries come be- partly because of the, the, the way he plays. It's very difficult for the for the body. Uh, but yeah, like you said, he, he's coming back. He's proven number of times that he's capable of coming back. Uh, the stage is set for a great final this this uh, this year, the Australian Open. We will talk about the draw later, but uh, we can have a dream dream final, Federer Nadal. So. Yeah, um, and people love him because because he loves Australia. He loves playing in the tournament. He has so so much nice words about the tournament that uh, you can see that the fans appreciate it. Yeah, we had a, a I suppose what the Yanks would call it a curveball player in as well, or a rookie. That's what I should should say. A Ukrainian Marta Kos, Kostyuk. She beat Kost, uh, yeah. Peng, Peng Shui. Peng Shui, and. Uh, yeah, that's the great thing about tennis, isn't it? Every now and again, you get get these kids coming in and they just smash someone out of it. It's great, and uh, yeah, I hope she goes on to great things. Yeah, uh, that was this was one of the big stories of the of the first night uh, in Australia. She's 15 years old. Um, she is the youngest player to qualify even for the Australian Open since 2005. Uh, she, but we have to say, she won the she won the girls uh, Wimbledon uh, last. Uh, sorry, the girls uh, Australian Open last year, so she's not completely unknown. Yeah. Uh, obviously, for us uh, or for, for you, for me, even for me who I follow tennis, uh, it's not a name that you would come across so regularly. So it's an amazing result. Uh, she beat she, she beat uh, number twenty seven in the world, which is in her age that's something. And it was like a very convincing win. It was six two six two. I don't know what what you make of it, but for me, it's just simply impressive. Yeah, Dodd, absolutely. Who was the, there was another uh, girl? It was a two or three years ago. Oh, I'm trying to think who it was. Because you know, back in the day, I used to I used to be, I, I used to really like trading on tennis, Johnny. Uh, before Betfair was was kicked out of Poland, mm. where I'm living, um, I used to love especially women's tennis because there's a ver- there's a couple of very simple strategies, and it would be lay. Lay the serving underdog when she's thirty nil up, you know. Simple, mm. you know. Mm. It's a, it's a, it was a very, it was a very good strategy for me. Um, but, for, but in women's tennis only, in men's men's tennis is a, it's a to use a cliche, it's a different ball game. It's uh, I, well, I don't know about you, but I, I actually prefer women's tennis because it's a bit more unpredictable. Uh, uh, to be honest, to be honest, buddy, men's tennis is better for it's better for betting. Uh, it's uh, for me. It's more enjoyable to watch mm-hmm. women's tennis. It's uh, just so unpredictable. Mm-hmm. But that's on one side. That, that's the danger of uh, betting on women's tennis. But on the other side, that's the joy of watching. That you never know yeah. what you can expect. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. talk about it when we talk about the women's draw. But uh, basically, we can have three, four, five, six winners of the Australian Open, or it can be even someone else from the from the women's draw. Yeah. It's just so unpredictable that it's so difficult to to. To judge. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree with you. Uh, look, we'll, we'll get on to the draw then. Um, no, actually, we won't. Tell you what. Uh, you spoke to um, a journalist friend of yours out in the Aussie Open. So uh, give a little introduction and we'll play. Uh, we have we have three parts here, so we'll, we'll play the first part for you. Yeah, Andre, Andre is, a, is a good friend of mine. He recently went to Australia to try a bit of different life. And part of his first experience, basically... One of the first days he spent in Melbourne was he was going to to Australian Open. He's a big uh, sports fan. He knows absolutely great great deal about sports and tennis. And he told us some very interesting insights directly from Melbourne Park. 
On Monday, the Melbourne Park welcomed the first tennis players in the first Grand Slam of the year, Australian Open. With me on the line from the other side of the world in Australia, Andre Petro from Slovakia. Hi, Johnny. Um, hi, Andre. Uh, we've known that you visited Melbourne Park yesterday. That was your first experience uh, at the Australian Open. How did you like it? Yeah, Johnny, you know, the Australian Open, it's a Grand Slam. It's something special. It's happening just uh, four times per year, you know. So every one Grand Slam is a special. Uh, I really love the atmosphere there. I love the bus. I love the energy from the people, from players, from the staff. Everything was really well organized. Um What was most special about the Melbourne Park itself? Uh, many players consider it as the best venue for tennis. We know that Rafael Nadal really loves the place and some other players uh, really uh, have only positive words about the venue, Melbourne Park. What was so special about it? You know, I've, I've got that feeling that uh, Australians want to make every everything... Uh, They plan it in the details, you know, they want to make every special detail to work out really good, you know, like the every court have, has a special atmosphere. There is a lot of things to do, not just uh, tennis things. There are a lot of food courts. Uh, there uh, are a lot of attractions, like, I mean, uh, there is stuff for children to do. There is stuff for uh, adults to do, you know, so... Uh, Really, you have signs every, everywhere. There are, uh, the stuff is really helpful to you, you know. And yeah, every court is a special, has a special atmosphere. So the people, everybody working on the, on that try to make, makes it as special as, as they can and try to make, uh, try to create a experience for, for players, for the staff. For referees, for fans, for everyone who is visiting Melbourne Park. Yesterday was the day one of the Australian Open 2018. What matches did you see, Andre? So, because I'm a Slovakian, so I focused on the Slovakian matches. So, first uh, Ribor Ribarikova against Townsend, and then Sibulkova against uh, Kanepi. Uh, was Different matches, you know, like, uh, I think Ribaric one is now in a good form, good shape, so she runs through Townsend quite uh, easily. And the second match, yeah, there was like a, a raining break, like for uh, half an hour, but it was a bit between two sets. It, like, Sibulkova couldn't find the rhythm, you know, and the canopy was the Better player, she strike really well, she served well, and Sibulkova couldn't uh, really play her game. Uh, then the next matches, I I wanted also to see for sure, of of course, uh, the men's draw. Uh, I realized uh, one of the upsets today. I I uh, one of the upsets uh, yesterday. Yesterday there was. Some of the upsets. So, for example, I've seen uh, Matthew Ebden, the home player, uh, defeat uh, John Isner in four sets. He, he played really well, and Isner also couldn't find his game. And then, yeah, uh, I really like the atmosphere on the smaller court. So, then uh, I've seen um, more matches. Check out ProTipster.com where you can earn money by sharing your tips and coupons. Sign up now and get our free daily newsletter where our experts share their tips. Go to ProTipster.com for more details. Let's uh, have a chat then about the, 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 the men's draw, uh, Johnny. So Djokovic's uh, first competitive match uh, since missing half a year with his elbow injury. How do you think he's going to get on? Um, Djokovic... Uh Djokovic won won his uh, opening match. Uh, he played overnight. Uh, he won against Donald Young of USA. It was pretty impressive, six one, six two, six four. What is the question about Djokovic? He, he's got his problems uh, almost for the last eighteen months. Uh, obviously, he missed uh, all the action after I think it was after Wimbledon. Uh, 
he did, he didn't took took part in any preparation tournaments. He only played in the exhibition. So that was some questions whether about his fitness uh, and how he can deal about that. I mean, he's but you have to we have to when we speak about Djokovic, we have to say he's the record uh, Australian Open title holder, holder. Sorry, with six trophies uh, from 2011 until 2016, he won six Australian Open uh, titles more than any other player in the, in the draw. So um, even Obviously, recently he's not as dominant as he as he used to be, and you have to understand that because he was so great for su- for such a long time that uh, at one point there just must be a, a part of his career when 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 he's not uh, and he's totally peak. But still, we have to count on him. Uh, he's very competitive, and you know him. Uh, he's he's really good fighter. So. He's got a potential fourth round uh, match if all goes up according to to plan with Alexander Zverev, which uh, is the new rising star of uh, tennis. I think he's the number four of, uh, in the in the world. Uh, that that would be a really really tough match. Obviously, the the, the question would be if Zverev is uh, consistent enough uh, in a five setter match to be to to beat Djokovic, but it will come also to question. How fit Djokovic is and how he proves in in the first matches. Then he would have a potential quarterfinal with uh, Stan Wawrinka, another big player who's coming back after injury, very similar to Djokovic. He missed half of the season last year, uh, so he's a bit unproven. He didn't play any any matches before. He cruised past uh, his opponent uh, tonight, uh, Wawrinka. He played uh, Burakis from Lithuania. He won 3-1, so he seems to be on the track as well. So, that, yeah, we'll see how Djokovic goes. But, of course, the crowd will love him as well because uh, he's a very emotional player and uh, he shows his passion and dedication to, to, to sports and tennis. So. It's an awful tough draw, though, isn't it? If Djokovic gets both of them on the way, like, oh, like him, him and Favrenka have already yeah. had... Plenty of really good yeah. battles over the years, you know. And Stan, I think Stan is coming. St- I, I don't think he's hit his peak yet. I think he's still. I, I think they think there's still potential there for him to to do better. Whereas jo- is is Djokovic has is Djokovic now? You know, is he finally now on the way down? He probably isn't yet. Probably another couple of years in him before we start to see a slide. But you know, I but, Paddy, what, I think I think. We cannot talk about yet about Djokovic being in a downtrend or going down. Uh, obviously, he had his problems. Uh, there were some rumors uh, which I heard from Serbian journalists that he had some personal problems as well. Uh, whether that is true or not, you know, it's hard to judge. But uh, I think uh, he, he still got the potential to to compete with the best and be one of the one of one of the best. Let's say it this way, one of the best. Mm. Maybe not the, the super best and so dominant as he was, but uh I think he's still got the potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I forgot I, for, I forgot to say sorry, just to to, to, to complete the picture. He's, he he also has Dominic Thiem in his quarter. <laughs> uh, Dominic Thiem is uh, another young guy yeah. who is really he's really a uh, uh, young prospective player. Uh, uh, Dominic Thiem is playing actually right now as we recorded. Uh, he's winning a 5-3 in the first set against Pella from Argentina. Uh, so, that's not, that's another tough uh, opponent possibly. So, the draw, yeah, is quite difficult for, uh, Djokovic. He's, he's, he would potentially face some young guns, but, uh, we'll see how, how he goes in the first matches, then we can, uh, talk about it because it all, it, it all will uh, depend how, how how he plays and how he feels in Australia. Yeah, and of course, and there's obviously Roger Federer as well. Federer's what 36 now, but you know yeah. he's just a god in, in tennis. Well, as as much as people love uh, Nadal and Djokovic, they they absolutely love Roger. Uh, at his 36 years, I mean 36, like Nadal, Djokovic, they missed the end of the season. Vavrinka, for example, but Federer was fine. Federer was. Uh, recovering after the after the season, preparing for the Australian Open without uh, major problems, uh, he's looking to to win his twentieth uh, uh, Grand Slam title. He won the Australian Open five times, so would be looking to match Djokovic six titles. 
he's of course the defending champion. Uh, he won the epic battle against Rafael Nadal uh, last year. Three, uh, it was three two on set. But he's got a he's in the toughest uh, quarter of the draw. Uh, he's got a potential fourth round against Query, Sam Query of USA, or Milos Raonic. I just have to look if actually Milos Raonic won his match. No, actually he lost his match. So Ooh. Raonic is out. Raonic lost against Slovakian Lukas Latsko, which is quite an unknown player. That was one of the surprises uh, at night. When I went to sleep, uh, Raonic was uh, actually still winning. So that's why I, I'm, I'm a bit a bit confused now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's the that's the beauty of Australian Open uh, for us in Europe. You know, you. you it's all played at night. Uh, obviously, you can catch some action in the morning or at late night, but then you have to choose. Either you stay up, stay up late at night, and then you miss the morning action, or you you go to sleep early and you catch some uh, early morning action. So, yeah. So he's got some query potentially in fourth round, but then he's got quarterfinal possibly against Till Potro, who is yet to play his first round. Uh, I think yeah, he plays against Tiafoe of USA still today, later today. Uh, or he could potentially play uh, David Goffin, which is the, another young gun from Belgium. Well, he's not that young actually now, but uh, yeah, he's, he's the rising star of tennis as well th- these days. So it's really, really, really tough draw for Federer, but I think if he can do, do this, then uh, yeah, he's one, of, for me, he's one of the, Main title contenders, but the odds for him to win the uh, the Australian Open were quite low. I think after the draw was made, it was around three, which is ooh, that was really low. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, what, what what other potential good uh, matchups do you see? I would love to see the final of Federer and Nadal. I mean, that's that's something uh, I would be really really looking for. Forward, but even if we, we when we talked about Djokovic and if he would play uh, Alexander Zverev in fourth round, that would be a, that would be already a classic. Uh, it's like the let's say the old generation, but you know I would have to say it in inverted commas because it's Djokovic is not old. Don't don't get me wrong, but Zverev was Alexander Zverev is obviously the the young prospect, and uh, he, if he would uh, challenge Djokovic, that would be interesting to see. Uh, I would be also looking forward. To, uh, to see Federer against Del Potro, possibly in the quarterfinals. Del Potro is also one of the players who had to deal with a lot of injuries in recent months and recent years, but he always proves how he loves the game, how he loves tennis, uh, uh, how he always comes back and competes, even uh, that he's not, as I said, he's quite unlucky with all the struggles he has, But uh, and that's why people love him as well. That would be an interesting one to see. Uh, and then I would be looking to see, for example, Grigor Dimitrov, number three in the world, what he can do uh, in the draw. And uh, he's got potential m- matchup uh, on the way to the quarterfinals with uh, Nick Kyrgios. We all know Kyrgios is a Australian Australian guy. He is one of the, let's say, is very crazy. I mean, uh, he, he he's known for his uh, attitude that uh, he can't. Sometimes he just he's, he can't his he keep his temperament. Uh, he's yeah, really wild. But he said this year I read an interview with him that he's going to change and he's going to dedicate more uh, into tennis. And but yeah, uh, that would be also interesting to see. Uh, but we all love a wild man, though, don't we? You know. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, uh, he's making show for the fans. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think he was in, the, in his first ma- in his first round uh, on the on the day one, he was charged for swearing at one of the fans. Yeah. Because somebody shouted, yeah, shouted during his sir. So he turned and uh, started swearing at the, the person. <laughs> so obviously he was charged with the wording. <laughs> yeah. See, the, the trick to do in situations like that is to learn how learn how to swear in in different languages. Like 
Like, 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 obviously, like, you know, <laughs> like obviously, I'm, if you're Australian, if you play at home, and if you yeah, swear in English, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that's gonna you're gonna get away with that. <laughs> like, like at home with my little fella, because he's at the age now where he repeats the words we say. I've had to stop swearing in in English, and now I try to be a bit more colourful and do it in like Italian or something like that. So no one has a clue what I'm saying. You know? <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> Right, let, let's go to the second part then of our interview. So, Andre, you told me before we started recording this podcast interview that you really liked the small courts and the fans and the atmosphere there because it was really close and it was really loud and uh, the fans were really cheering for their for their favorites. Uh, who had the most fans there and what nations of fans did you meet? Uh, because we know that Melbourne is a quite multicultural city. Yeah. Uh, it's well known that here in Australia are a lot of Greeks, so their favorite is definitely Marcos Vatsis. So every everybody who would be in the Melbourne Park, uh, Park I would recommend uh, to visit the match of Marcos Vatsis because the Greek fans can make really atmosphere like in a football game, you know. And yeah. Uh, another thrilling ma- match yesterday was between uh, uh, Damir Jumhur against Paolo Lorenzi and like it was Italians against Bosnia. It was also like really really original atmosphere. Like reminding it reminded me of football games in some points, you know. And uh, then I, I could say the same about the Australian fans. They are really awesome. Like how they can cheer. Uh, their home players or the Chileans, you know, the Latin Americans, uh, also here in Australia, the Latin Americans. So there was their player, Jerry. So uh, it was just interesting to be like uh, some kind of natural guy and like being in these matches. Because, yeah, I supported Slovakians. I met some Slovakian people. But... To be honest, we are not not so, not so many of us, and we are not so loud like other nationalities. Hmm. Now I will jump on a completely different topic, but uh, we had the the news uh, here in Europe about uh, the weather in Australia that it's really hot, and there were some problems with some matches and the preparation tournaments for the Australian Open. What is the current weather now in Melbourne? Uh. I think it's better now, like, uh, yeah, last weekend the weather wasn't really good, like Melbourne, it's close to sea, so it's really wet here, also yesterday there was, like, it was raining, like, for for one hour, but then just sun goes up and it was quite hot weather, uh, now I think it's already warmer, like, now here is a Tuesday, and the prediction for the next day is also positive and I think it's uh, like it, it could be really really hot here as you probably know podcasts still grow by word of mouth show your support for the pro tipster football show by telling your football mad friends all about our podcast or by leaving a nice review for us on iTunes. Johnny, uh, the women's draw, uh, how do you see this going? So, uh, number one, uh, Simona Halep, she's never won a Grand Slam, but um, yeah, she's number one. Uh, how do you think she's going to win? Yeah, Simona Halep is one of the, I think one of the two players in the draw that would deserve to win finally a Grand Slam because there are two players that never won a, a Grand Slam uh, and are the favourites to take it uh, finally this time in Australia. And that's, Number one, Simone Halep, and then, uh, Caroline Wozniacki from, uh, from Denmark. Um, it's, I mean, it, it's actually quite impressive that, uh, well, it's only, uh, I used, to, used the wrong English word, but, uh, <laughs> the opposite for, of for impressive. Their, <laughs> uh, exa- exactly, exactly, but, uh, because they're great players, they won mm-hmm. so many matches, so many tournaments, but uh, it's kind of, yeah. It's it's a bit sad that they never won a Grand Slam because they would totally deserve it. Mm, absolutely. So, and that's why I, I, I'm actually going to root for these these two these two girls uh, to to have a potentially good run this time and to make most of it. And 
to maybe to to even win uh, it's going to be it's not going to be it's not going to be easy but um yeah uh Halep is number 1 Wozniak is number 2 seed but then we've got number 3 Garbin Garbin Muguruza uh, of Spain who is uh she's won the Grand Slam I think two times before uh so she's got the winning mentality uh she is struggling uh from now and then with injuries so but she should be fit for for this tournament well we've got obviously number 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 5 seed Venus Williams is out already that uh gives uh, some floor for others we've got number 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 7 seed Yelena Ostapenko uh, i don't know if you remember but there was a she she won the the french open uh, last year i think what it was after a great run uh, at that time she was uh, nobody nobody really knew about this player but uh, she she was like really shocked everyone winning it but she was she was really good so yeah there are some there are some names there's Karolina Pliskova from Czech Republic uh, number 6 uh, who can who can compete with the best uh, there is uh, Elena Svitolina from Ukraine number 4 seat uh, she's also for, for me, one of the favorites. I, I think there are, to be honest, there are p- p- possibly six or seven, well, let's say six, pl- six or five or six players who can possibly win the women's draw. So it's very difficult to predict. Uh, as I said, generally, women's tennis uh, is quite difficult to to predict. Mm-hmm. You have to count, you have to expect unexpected, as I like to say. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's uh, this. This is why I used to love. Uh, trading tennis on Betfair because there's so many swings and price changes that if you can stick to uh, a kind of strategy with, with with strict kind of filters, you, you, there's a potential to make to make some money on on, on stuff like this, you know. Yeah. Uh, but but definitely, Johnny, I want I want I do want to learn more from you because I don't I, don't, I actually don't don't bet at all on tennis since uh, since Betfair left uh, left Poland. Mm. Uh, it is something I, I should I should really get back into. Um, look, do you want to have a chat about the British players? But obviously, we have a lot of uh, British listeners. Yeah, of of course, the big story about the British players. There's no Andy Murray because of his hip injury. That's a that's a big blow for for, uh, for the whole UK and for the British uh, fans. Uh, it was, I have to say, it was a bit expected that he will miss the Australian Open, but still, obviously. It's not the news you want to hear before the Australian Open. Uh, however, Kyle Edmund, uh, the number two in Britain, uh, did please uh, British fans on the day one. Uh, he won an epic, epic match against uh, Kevin Anderson. Uh, it was a five setter, so it was three two for uh, for Edmund. Although I think it took a bit more than uh, four hours, which is, it's a long match. Uh, what's a bit worrying that the uh, uh, Kyle had to take a shoulder treatment. I think it was after set one. So, but he should be all right. I mean, if 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 you take a treatment and then you play another four sets, then it it probably suggests that you you are able you are okay to to play uh, another match or two. And he's got, now that uh, he defeated Anderson, next up for him is uh, Dennis Istomin. Uh, the, the story with Dennis Istomin, the last year he beat Novak Djokovic. Uh, and Djokovic lost only one match from uh, in Australian Open from 2001 until 2017. So, if, if, if you imagine... If from 2011 to 2007, that's quite a long, long period of time. <laughs> if if you imagine what, what you can do, it what you can do in six years. So, 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 yeah, that proves that Danny system is probably capable of uh, doing some great things, but he actually never stepped over his shadow. Yeah. So Kyle Edmund plays Danny system in the next round, but after that, if he would manage to beat uh, Istomin. He's got no seeds until quarterfinals, so the draw is uh, pretty good for him. Uh, however, if uh, I'm not so sure if uh, it will be a difficult one for him against Istomin. Uh, he is the favorite. I think the bookies are 
uh, priced him around 1.4 or 1.45, depends where you look. But uh, it's not going to be so easy mm. for him. And then, obviously, for the women's women's part, you got Joanna Conta. Uh, she was she was the quarterfinalist here last year, semifinalist the year before. However, she also had some uh, fitness worries before the tournament. Uh, however, uh, she played overnight uh, her first round match, and she was pretty impressive. She played Brangle, Madison Brangle from I think she's from the United States, and she won. But she hit 37 winners and eight aces, which is pretty impressive. Uh, not bad for a start, let's say it this way. So. Yeah, the expectation, I mean, she's, I think, potentially the player that, uh, from the, from the British players that are left at the Australian Open, she, she has the, let's say, the biggest, uh, the biggest potential. But, uh, yeah, she will need a bit of uh, luck as well and to keep the momentum. If she can keep the momentum from, from the first round, then, I mean, she will, in my opinion, she will uh, reach at least, uh, fourth round but if she can do beyond that uh, I'm not so sure uh, as, as, uh, there are some other players but yeah I'm expecting Conta to, to, to represent Britain in the best way alright uh, look uh, we'll go to the th- third and final part of, of your interview then but but first um, what what's your opinion on this shot clock that's 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 new at the Aussie Open so you only have 20 seconds between serves yeah well if, if I was Rafael Nadal, I would probably complain. <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> with, uh, and when they asked him about this, he said uh, it's not really good for tennis. Uh, I can see why he said that, because he needs quite some time to uh, between the serves and he needs to concentrate. Uh, as for the game itself, it's interesting. I mean, it's uh, it's placed in, on, in the court so that everybody gets, can see it. So... It, but it, at the same time, it creates a bit of pressure on, on the players. Uh, on the other side, it gives uh, the game more consistency, and that's what fans want to see. They don't want to see long breaks between every every point, you know. Uh, however, uh, it should be treated carefully. Uh, like like Nadal said, and in, in a point of view, I agree with him that uh, uh, especially. In uh, you, play, you you imagine you play in Melbourne when it can get really hot, uh, and you play the five setter. So if you want to keep the quality of the match high throughout the whole match, even in even after let's say four or five hours, then you cannot expect uh, maybe the players to to take only twenty seconds uh, between every point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it'll probably it'll probably it'll probably end up being a bit like basketball. You know, basketball has the 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 twenty yeah. five second thing as well yeah. and and you know as a game goes on the 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 plays get closer and closer to 25 you know uh, as as the game goes on at the start of the match you know everyone's shooting within you know 10 15 seconds but by the end you a lot of people are, are are close to that or even they give away penalties uh, because they've gone over the time so and, and and what is the penalty if they go over uh i'm not so sure about this uh, as far as i understood uh as it, as it usually comes, it first will be a warning uh, from the uh, empire, yeah. and then yeah, and then yeah, it follows it with another shows. warning, taking a point, and yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So, uh, but I think it will be more, uh, it will be treated uh, carefully this time. I mean, it, it's something new on the circuit, and uh, I think uh, the empires will will take it easy. I think this mm-hmm. time, okay, cool. uh, still. Right, so look, let's go to the third part of our interview then. Now I will. I want to know your opinion. Uh, the men's draw is, looks quite interesting. We have uh, Roger Federer, who is aiming for, I think, for his sixth Australian Open title. We have Novak Djokovic, who already won the Australian Open six times, but who hasn't played for half a year. We've got Rafael Nadal, who was also injured last uh, end of the last season. We've got Stan Wawrinka coming back after injury. Uh, so it, we have no Andy Murray, which is a, a big blow for the British fans. Who do you think might win the might lift the trophy in the men's draw of the Australian Open? So I think there, 
wouldn't be any upset. Like I, my my favorite uh, would is one of this uh, trio: Djokovic, Nadal, Federer. But I think one of the young guns can get really, really uh, true, maybe to semifinals. Like in a year draw, there are a lot of talented players. Like yesterday, uh, Andrei Rublev, the young Russian, he played really, really well against Ferrer. But I, I got that feeling that he's like missing some experiences. So these young guns really need to get uh, more experiences. Like Australian hopes that, that Nick Kyrgios can get through, mm, can get far uh, in a tournament. But it's the mental thing, you know, and uh, Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, they play, played a lot of uh, difficult matches. So for me, Nadal looked really, really excellent yesterday. So if, if he will stay healthy, he will win the Australian Open. Okay, so you think Rafael Nadal can win, uh, win the Australian Open? Um, turning to the women's side of the draw it's uh, Serena Williams is not taking part uh, in the last minute she she said she's not uh, re yet ready after giving uh, birth so we've got quite few names who could who could potentially take the title we've got Gabi Muguruz we've got uh, perhaps uh, Simone Halep or Angelika Kerber who had who didn't really have a good season uh, last year uh, I know women's tennis is quite unpre unpredictable, but uh, who do you think might take the women's title? Uh, I think there uh, could be a surprise winner, like uh, the Eastern Country uh, girls, girls from Eastern countries like Ostapenko, Svitolina. They they can go really quite. Quite far. Uh, like yesterday, we experienced uh, quite a surprise. Like Benchich knock out uh, Winas Williams, you know. But Benchich has a really, really good uh, uh, pre-tournament, the preparation tournament, the Hoffman Cup. She played really good there. So, uh, yeah, as you said, it's it's hard to predict the winner. But yeah, it it could be Angelic Kerber. It could be. Mm, somebody really unexpected. I like. I, I really want to Magda Ribarikova to go really far. Hopefully, if if she can make a run like uh, in last years, like in Wimbledon, it would be awesome for Slovakian fans. But yeah. Uh, also, here are some really really young young tennis uh, players who. Who will shine? So we will see. I I don't I I I'm I will not say it the mm. one name. There will be some upset. Mm. Okay, and the very last question for Andre. As we have uh, we are recording now, it's uh, almost almost midnight here in uh, UK. Give me one name of of the player you will cheer most for. So I just want to hear one name. It can be a man or woman's name that you will be really cheering for in this year in the Australian Open. So, as the patriot, I would say uh, Magda Ribarikova. Andre, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, and let's let's speak soon. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Have a good one. If you have any betting questions you'd like to ask, don't be shy. Get in touch with Patty, Martin, or Dan on Twitter, ProTipster IRL, ProTipster EN, or ProTipster DAN, or on Facebook at ProTipster UK. Okay, so we're back, and uh, Johnny's going to give us a couple of p early picks uh, for Wednesday. So, yeah, there are some interesting matches for Wednesday. Uh, first, I would I would like to invite all the listeners. You can follow me on. Uh, we will. Repeat this at the end of the podcast, but on, on uh, Facebook and on Twitter, where I share the, the most up-to-date uh, picks of mine. Obviously, with the time difference, uh, you can expect my picks to to to, to be published at around midnight uh, 
Central Europe time, so that's uh, 11 uh, p.m. UK time, or around, around this time, obviously, just before the play starts in Melbourne. But to speak er, about some early selections uh, from the Wednesday matches, uh, I was looking at a few matches already. Um, one I'm looking forward is uh, Gilles Simon playing uh, Pablo Corino Busta. Um, Corino Busta is... Uh, is the favorite in this match, uh, slight favorite. However, Gilles Simon, uh, played some good tennis, uh, at the, at the, at the start of the season. He won a tournament in India. I think it was in Pune or, uh, the name of the town or something like this. Or a city. Uh, then he, he was knocked out, uh, in the, in the next tournament, uh, pretty quickly in the first round, but then, but I would not be too, too concerned about uh, about this. So Gilles Simon is playing the kind of tennis that you that you don't want to play against. Uh, okay, now he's 57 in the world. Corena Busta is number 11. So you you can tell me that okay, I'm crazy. But actually now I'm looking at the odds and the odds shifted the other way. So now this Simon is favorite for the bookies, which only confirms my way of thinking. Let's say this way. Uh, Simon is is kind of player who can cover the court well. Uh, he's kind of the he doesn't play a really nice tennis because he tries all he all he does he tries to get the ball back on the other side of the court. Uh, but it, yeah, he's successful in what he what he's doing. Uh, I found a stat uh, that he he lost eight out of nine last matches uh, at the. In Australian Open against top ten players, so that makes only one out of nine <laughs> matches losing against uh, players outside of top ten. Okay, Corena Busta is number eleven, so that's almost like a top ten. But uh, it shows how consistent he is when he plays. Let's say not the really top guys, but the rest of the field. Uh, of course, it, it can be he can be a blow as well. I mean, Simone is not uh, is not Federer or, or Nadal, but he's got the game to to, to upset Carreno Busta. So that would be my first selection. Uh, going on, uh, I was looking at uh, Marcus Bagratis of Cyprus and Rublev of Russia. Uh, Rublev uh, is one of the young prospects of the game. He's beaten uh, David Ferrer, uh, but he's got a consistency problem, uh, Rublev. He gave away some big leads in that match, and I'm not too convinced he can do against uh, Marcos. Marcos is, uh, will have a great support in Australia. Uh, now he's uh, obviously a bit, bit older. He is the finalist from 2006. He lost against Roger Federer in the final, although he took a set from him. Uh, he loves also playing in Australia as well, so oh, that should that should help as well. Uh, so yeah, the odds for Marcus uh, to win are a bit higher. I think we can find something around three point twenty five. That's that's quite a value. Uh, he's as I said, he's he's older now, so he's he's thirty two. But he's got the game. He's very consistent. Uh, he, he's got the, he's got good serve on his good days, <laughs> I have to say, not always. Uh, he's got a good forehand as well. He's got the game to, to take Rublev into some, into some crisis and I just see this as a, as a, as a value. Going on, uh, I've got Shapovalov to beat Tsonga. Uh, Danny Shapovalov, uh, Canadian player. With a Russian name, Joe Wilfried Tonga is a well-known, well-known tennis player for, for all of us. So that's again, I'm going for the value here. Shapovalov beat him, beat Tonga last year at the U.S. Open. Uh, he was and Shapovalov was great against uh, Titi Pass uh, in in the first round. Another very prospective player. So I expect him to to trouble Tsonga a lot. Tsonga is an uh, interesting player. Uh, fans love him as well because he's a he's a showman. He he does. Uh, he, he's the kind of player you want to you want to watch. He's very enjoyable to 
to watch uh, on the court. So, so yeah, uh, Shapovalov to, to 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 trouble him is is the selection for for this one. Then I've had a look at the women's draw. Uh, I have to say I'm not a big favorite of uh, picking a women's uh, women's picks on women's tennis because, as I said several times uh, during this podcast, it's just so unpredictable. But I had a look at two matches. Uh, Magdalena Ribarikova of uh, Slovakia to beat uh, Christian Flipkins. Uh, Magdalena, she's an inter- interesting player. Uh, she Last year, she had a great run in Wimbledon. She made the semifinals. And she's 3-1 in head-to-head against Flipkins. Uh, I saw her in the first round against... Uh, Terra Townsend from USA. She won very comfortably, six nil and seven five. And she seems to be, she seems to be in quite good form. The, the problem with her, she was fighting with injuries over the last couple of years. Let's say last year she had a good, good year. She made it into top twenty. She became the, the tennis player of the year in Slovakia, and she was finally healthy. Although she had her struggles at the end of the season with uh, some health problems, but she seems to be she seems, the first first round proved she seems to be all right. She, she she should be too strong for Flipkins. And the last match I want to mention is Kaya Kanepi to beat Puig. Uh, I think this uh, this is the player from either Puerto Rico or Paraguay. Now I, I I'm not hundred percent hundred percent sure. Uh, Monica Puig. But, uh, uh, yeah, Kaya Canopy made one, one of the surprises in the round one. She beat Dominika Tibulkova of Slovakia and she was pretty, pretty impressive. Kaya, uh, is, she's a great player. She had some problems, uh, with injuries. Uh, but she seems to be back after a long, uh, injury break. She, she's, she's 6-1 in this season. She only lost to, to Pliskova. And she was even very competitive in uh, in that match. So Puig can have a she's an interesting player. She can have uh, moments of being very brilliant, but then she can be really horrible. <laughs> and I'm not and I'm not really convinced that uh, hard courts are the best surface for her. Uh, but if I should compare these two, then uh, Kaya kind of be she is the more consistent. An accurate player, so she should take this one. Uh, the odds might be a bit short, so I would even try a, a game handicap on 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 Kaya on Kaya Kanepi. Puig played the first round match with uh, Samantha Stosser, another Australian, uh, let's say nowadays uh, almost a veteran. Uh, she's got her age, uh, and to be honest, Samantha Stosser could could easily win this match, but she choked at the end. But uh, that's women's tennis. Mm-hmm. So that's my selection. But of course, I will update this, uh, not the list, but this, this these picks, and I will publish them on uh, Facebook. Be sure to join our tennis groups. Uh, follow me on Twitter. On uh, also on Facebook for the latest uh, picks and on Pro Tips or on my pro- profile Pro Tips Johnny where I publish all, all my picks uh, <coughs> for the night. Excuse me. Yeah, exactly. Get over to Facebook, have a look for Pro Tips UK, and then within that uh, page you'll find groups. Uh, we have uh, football, uh, fo- uh, Premier League, and ch- um, English football group. We've uh, European football group, tennis group, NBA group, and uh, NHL group as well. So get come over there, get involved, and have a look at. Uh, at uh, Johnny's tips because uh, you know he's 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 our tennis expert for a reason. Um, yeah, so you gave us uh, Twitter and and Facebook there, uh, Johnny. So look, thanks very much for joining me, and we'll be back on Friday with another uh, tennis podcast. So uh, yeah, this is the first uh, tennis podcast that we've done. We hope that you enjoyed it, and uh, make sure and tell your uh, tennis uh, loving friends all about us. You can get us on iTunes, Stitcher. All of those other Android podcatchers. Uh, we're up on YouTube as well. And we're over on the Pro Tipster blog. Make sure and check out protipster.com where you can earn real money by sharing your winning sports tips. So for me and Pro Tipster Johnny, Johnny, I'll do it again. So for me and Pro Tipster Johnny, 
Enjoy the tennis. We'll be back on Friday. Good luck. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out ProTipster.com, where you can earn money by sharing winning football tips. Check us out on YouTube and Instagram. Our handles there are ProTipsterGlobal. Or get in touch on Twitter, ProTipsterEN or ProTipsterIRL. Bye.